Hello again. And now we're finally on to the actual deck championship with the 40 deck field. This time I'm going to be talking about the group stage. Now, normally when I run a deck tournament, I'm going to run it with just Swiss pairings, because with my two game matches, it's three results, win, lose, or draw, and Swiss just tends to handle this best. However, for this championship, I didn't just want to go with Swiss pairings, because Swiss pairings might have jumped to the best versus best matchups a little too quickly for my taste. There are some decks that can deal with other decks in their weight class fairly well, but don't do a very good job of farming decks one weight class below them. And by having a three-round group stage, I made sure that all the top decks had to face at least two or three weaker opponents before they started playing against the other top contenders. You know, a contender that goes 50-50 against other top contenders, but if it doesn't farm the 21 through 40 decks, that deck is just not as good as a deck that can go 50-50 against it and farm the 21 through 40 decks. So I put each deck into one of 10 round-robin groups, which you're probably seeing in text around my head right about now. Each group had one top 10 seed, one 11 through 20 seed, one 21 through 30 seed, and one 31 through 40 seed. I turned each of these groups into one episode post on Reddit as this tournament went by. And since I had some groups that I was able to play before the qualification stage, these groups got spread over many months. Now, I had a second reason to run a group stage as well as just wanting to collect information on how well the top decks farmed. This tournament was always sort of likely to produce a lot of draws and a lot of variance in individual match results compared to a tournament of weaker decks. And with Swiss rounds, I might run out of legal pairings that aren't rematches in a shorter tournament than if I have a group stage first, because a lot of the time with Swiss rounds you get the top versus top very fast, and then you've gone through rounds and you've eliminated some things, and it's oops, everyone's played everyone. And because of these likelihood for lots of draws and lots of variants, I knew I might need more data than I would for any normal tournament. Now, why am I saying I expect a lot of draws and a lot of variants? Because this is sort of an interesting question. The way broken tier decks work, as decks get more and more broken, their variance in how strong they perform in each game tends to go up rather than down. And this is mostly because a top deck with a really good draw does things that an average or good deck can only dream of doing and will never actually do. But a top deck with an absolute dog of a draw looks surprisingly similar to a normal deck with a kind of bad draw. Not as bad a draw as the top deck had, but still not a great draw. However, when you're playing top deck versus average deck, the game tends to go long enough that if the top deck starts out with a dog of a draw, they will eventually draw all their good cards. The normal deck is going to run out of new good cards to draw, and as a result, the top deck will eventually start crushing in the end of the game and win the game anyway. But when both decks are good and both decks are capable of just breaking bases out of nowhere or neutering the opposing deck within a couple turns if they have all the right stuff, a top deck with a bad draw against an almost top deck with a good draw does not have a chance to draw its good cards. And for that reason, a lot of time, there's more chances for draw luck to produce an upset when the decks just do more per turn. Now, for the overarching performances of how different kinds of decks did in the group states, most of the bad losing records in the group stage came from decks that looked pretty similar to each other and quite consistently beat normal through very good opposition. I'll call them all A-class board control decks. By A-class, I pretty much mean good enough to beat an average Robots, Aliens, or Geeks deck, good enough to beat most random combinations of top 20 factions pretty consistently, but not good enough to measure up to something like Aliens with a top partner or Robots with a top partner. You know, if they get paired against Alien Time Travelers or they get paired against Elder Geeks, they're going to be in a bad shape in that matchup. The board control part means they tend to play a slightly slower game, maybe with a lot of card trades, maybe with a lot of just things that give both players more of an opportunity to get deeper in their deck. When you draw deeper in your deck before the game ends, draw luck matters less. 
draw luck mattering less is great when you're the favorite, and it allowed a bunch of these A-class board control decks to qualify into this tournament. Draw luck not mattering much is terrible when your opponent is world class, and you aren't quite world class, because all of a sudden, now you're evening out the draw luck when you are no longer the favorite, and you're getting smashed. A little aside on this kind of deck in a larger game, board control decks do suffer the same sort of Peter principle. They reach a point where suddenly they fail hard in three-player games, but for what I would call reasonable assumptions on your opponent's playstyle, they seem to succeed or fail based on the base-breaking ability of the slower of the two opposing decks. One fast opponent and one not very good opponent, a lot of times a board control deck can just deal with controlling the fast opponent and then find plays that give the slower opponent no choice but to work with them if the slower opponent wants a chance to get back in the game, and that usually allows the board control deck to claim an advantageous position. Two fast opponents means they can't target their gotcha cards on the one dangerous opponent, and usually one opponent makes a run at something, they burn some cards on stopping it, and the other opponent goes hog wild, and next thing the board control deck knows, it's in third place on victory points, and the board control deck is in the position where their opponents get to give them deals they can't refuse because it's the only way for them to get back in the game, and then somebody else just hits 15. So I'm listing a whole bunch of different board control decks here, many of which earn their spots by beating up other A-class decks to get a high rating, but there's one really extra dramatic example in Inca Dragons. Inca Dragons made it to this tournament as the number 9 seed, a top 10 seed, top seed in their group, by beating a Robots deck, an Aliens deck, and a Geeks deck 2 to nothing each. And this sort of led to me making a post where I talked about how great does this Inca Dragons deck look, and this looks like Incas might be really good at beating some of the top options. I still think Incas have pretty good matchups against Geeks, Aliens, and Robots, but just not so much against the very top examples of those. The thing is, beating Geeks random, or Aliens random, or Robots random isn't that crazy, but winning six games in a row against Geeks, Aliens, and Robots random, that is a much bigger deal. If you are a 3-1 to one favorite in every game you play, a winning six games out of six still happens less than 18% of the time, and if a deck is a 3-1 favorite against Aliens random, they're probably an 1800-some-odd ELO-rated deck, which would put them in my top 10 deck ratings. In other words, a deck that can do that is likely either they got very, very lucky, or they really deserve to be here. Then Inca Dragons made it to this tournament, where the Aliens deck are Alien slash good, rather than Alien slash random. The Robots decks are Robots slash really good. The Geeks decks are Geeks slash good. And Inca Dragons promptly lost six games in a row. Thing is, about them, I don't think Inca Dragons with an amazing hand works that much faster than Inca Dragons with a below average hand. The really strong things they do require a couple turns to work, and if they get a couple turns to work, they win. If they don't get a couple turns to win, there may be just no combination of cards they can draw that can actually save them. They, have, they are screwed. They have no counterplay. Another deck that I think had an interesting and disappointing group stage was Alien Time Travelers. Now, this is one of the most famous top decks because they've been around since there were only 20 possible factions in the game of Smash Up, and since then, Time Travelers gained a Titan, so they've got a long and storied history as a power deck. Ultimately, they proved their group stage result a little bit unlucky. They went 2-4 and four in the group stage, but an odd number of decks managed 3-3 three and three or better records, and Alien Time Travelers were the highest seeded 2-4 and four deck. So because of that, they got to advance out of the group stage anyway, and actually won 3 out of 4 games in the Swiss rounds to finish 5-5 five and, five and in the middle of the pack, which is probably a pretty fair assessment of their strength in this group. After playing through 9 of the 10 groups, I was looking at a 7-way tie for first place at a 5-1 record. 4 Geek decks, 2 Alien decks, and the actual Alien Geek deck. So, at this point it's looking like, well, Geeks and Aliens are still the bosses here, and we've got a big logjam at the top. The final group involved the Elder Geeks as the top seed, an old bugaboo from 2016, Ghost Zombies as second seed, 
Pirate Rockstar seated third, and the Qualifier Spider Aliens as the lowest seat. Elder Geeks this time was not able to live up to expectations. They lost both games to Ghost Zombies. One of those two games was not close, and then dropped a third game against the Pirate Rockstars. The big thing that happened to Elder Geeks is Elder Things have three minions which they can't play on an empty board. They need either six power or two minions in play to get their Shogo, their Elder Thing, in play. And as a matter of fact, in the third game that they lost against the Pirate Rockstars, they ended that game with both Shogoths and their Elder Thing in hand, but not possible to play. In 2016, they were usually able to Madness Spam, Band List, and Power of Madness their way to enough of a game stall that they could get away with fixing their hand and get a position where they could power up a Game Guru to 6 power somehow, or just have two Game Gurus in play, get out their Shogoths, and in the end, their minion supply would turn out to be good enough. In 2021, the game goes faster, and when they get a questionable hand early on, they actually just lose the game before they're able to, not so much just before they're able to get into a position where their Shogoths get out, but an opponent might be able to base break fast enough to make sure that Shogoth is just never coming out. However, despite their 1-3 and three start, they did manage to finish 3-3 three and three and make it out of the group stage because their third opponent was Spider Aliens. Spider Aliens, if you remember the way I talked about how it plays last episode, that method of just going to Invader Solitaire and trying to back things up with sort of the passive and reactive Spider-Verse specials, that does not work against Elder Geeks at all, and it was a completely free win for Elder Geeks. I suspect Spider Aliens are also a completely free win for Cthulhu T paired with most random good factions. So the absolute cancer deck from 2016 has received some major radiation poisoning over the ensuing five years. I'm going to talk about a second deck in the same group, the Ghost Zombies. I previously wasn't terribly high on Ghost Zombies as a deck before the Titans because... I just didn't see the synergy, and in the six or eight games I played, they performed like the average of ghosts and zombies. Yes, you can discard Tenacious Z to Spirit, but other than that, I wasn't really seeing a lot of special synergy. I would rather, when playing with ghosts, in even Ghost T, Ghost NT or Ghost T, I would rather be getting my supply of extra cards from drawing new stuff off the top of the deck so I can be unpredictable, rather than getting stuff back from my discard pile so that my opponent knows what I'm holding. An extra 2 power from Tenacious Z on top of Ghost NT was nice, but usually not enough to win in positions which have to be won via burst rather than sustained power. As it so happens, an extra 2 power changes from nice to frequently game-winning once you add Cream Puff Man into the mix. Five of Ghost Zombies' six games in the group stage were close, but all six of them were wins, and they managed to become the sole leader of the tournament after the group stage, set up for a fourth round showdown with the number one ranked Robot Geeks. Now, five close games is a bit of a bad sign. Champions win close games is a meme that is not well justified by statistics or reality. Champions, in fact, the biggest, they win a lot of blowouts. But there's a little bit of a caveat here. If you're winning your close games with positive VP chip, not Dragon's VP penalties, but positive VP chip where you can actually win the game out of a tied score without having to break a base to do it, your close games count for more because if you have VP chip, it means that if you're able to force a tied position, it's frequently a guaranteed win rather than you have to worry about what the other guy has in hand. It's not quite as bad a sign as a deck without ghosts or aliens would have from five close games, but it's still five close games. Overall, at the end of the group stage, here's what the table looked like. There's 26 decks remaining, and we have this big clog of aliens and geeks deck at the top. I'm going to sort these decks out by style. If a deck belongs to more than one style, I'm just counting the more successful style and not including the deck in its second style, because I'm sort of, I'm assuming here that the stronger idea the deck has is probably the one that got them through group stage. 
offensive geek decks, we have three of them at five and one, and one of them hanging on at three and three, the Innsmouth Geeks. Defensive geek decks, there are almost as many at five and one, two at five and one, one at four and two, and one at three and three. So the group stage, in fact, did not really seem to make any sort of a difference between the two different styles of geek decks. Aggressive alien decks. Two of these are the two alien decks sitting on five and one, and then there's one aggressive alien deck at three and three. Standard alien decks, we've got one at four and two, and one that eked in at two and four on a lifeline. Then we start getting to things other than geeks and alien decks. There's a whole bunch of general double aggro decks that made it through the group stage. One of them is the undefeated ghost zombies, and then there's a clot of five of them with four wins and two losses, plus one with three wins and three losses. The thing about these decks is they're probably higher variance than the more defensive decks in the field, because if their opponent has a slow hand, they might be able to end the game before the opponent gets a chance to draw good cards. On the other hand, when they draw badly, they frequently don't have much in the way of defensive plays that they can use to stall the game out until they draw better. So they may randomly win more games, but also randomly lose more games. I'm not sure where to slot Exploring Avengers as a style, but they're 4-2. and two. Cthulhu Madness Attacks decks. Two of them made it through the group stage, one at 4-2, and two, one at 3-3. Three and three. Then there's also Cthulhu with Defensive Partner, one sitting at 4-2. and two. So, looking at this, it's like we've seen the Geeks decks of both styles. The Aliens decks, it seems that Offensive is a little bit better for them. The Double Aggro has done very well. Rush decks seem to be a thing here. And the Cthulhu decks, it's still not clear whether the spam madness idea or the tank up while ha taking a longer time to send madness at the opponent idea works better. But we're not seeing anything that looks like, uh, well, technically one of the madness attack decks actually is sort of aggro Cthulhu. Cthulhu Anansi is pretty aggro. But n other than aliens, geeks and Cthulhu, we're just not sure yet at this point which type of partner strategy works best for them. And finally, at 3 and 3, there are two combo decks, the Inca Steampunks and Mad Scientist Pirates. These are decks, especially with Inca Steampunks. Inca Steampunks, when their deck worked, they just won. When their deck did not work, they just lost. And the other Inca decks were not able to do well, because Inca Steampunks has that extra gear they go into when they get a lucky draw, and the other Inca decks don't have mechanic. In contrast, Mad Scientist Pirates tends to win when their opponent doesn't have a way to deal with a giant, possibly indestructible giant, first mate. And that's what this field looks like at this point. It certainly seems like the double aggro decks are doing well, but when it comes to Geeks, Aliens, Cthulhu, we're not sure what version of those works best. The Swiss rounds through the end of the tournament should take me either one or two videos, and I honestly don't know what I'm going to talk about when with them. That's actually the final video is the hardest one for me to figure out. But it'll probably be out in another week or so, I would guess. And at that point, I'll have covered the entire 2021 tournament, and I'll talk a little bit about my plans for what I'm going to do with Smash Up in 2022. And I'll see you guys next video.